In this video, we're going to look at pages 8 to 15 of Stephen Shreve's Stochastic Calculus for Finance Part 1, where we understand how to derive the risk neutral price and delta hedge required of an option following a multi period binomial model. To begin, let's take a look at the multi period binomial model, expanding on the previous model where we've further periods of change to the stock price determined by a random coin flip. Subsequent coin flips are denoted with the number and the combination of heads and tails that are returned. So we have S2HH for two heads, S2HT for heads followed by tails, and so on with a third period as well denoted by S3HHH for three heads, and so on. To simplify this video on how to determine the risk neutral price, if we sold an option, I'll reduce the periods on the option to just two. Our approach to solving for x0 and delta0 will be to work backwards from the end of our binomial model to the start. We will solve for the neutral price and delta hedge of x1h and delta 1h using the values of s2hh and s2ht, and then we will calculate x1t and delta 1t using those stock values for s2ht and also s2tt. We're effectively splitting our two period binomial model into two one period models from S1H and S1T. Once we understand these prices, we can then do the same for X0 and delta zero. While it's not necessary to understand the delta required at each time period, we will calculate this and show how the delta held by the seller of the option must change at each time period to appropriately hedge their position. This means that as time periods pass and the price of the stock is revealed, the delta on the hedge will need to be adjusted as the potential upward and downward movements of the option value change. For example, let's visit our model from the previous video, where we used the risk neutral price of 1.2 to sell a European option with a strike of 5, where the stock price starts at 4, it can rise to 8 or 4 to 2 in one period. We'll have an interest rate of 0.25, and we know that we also need a delta of 0.5 to hedge this exposure. So our agent borrows 0.8 from the money market at time zero and owes one at time one due to the 25% interest rate. And given a heads coin flip, the agent has a stock value of four and a cash position of negative one to leave them on three. And this perfectly matches the value of the option that they've sold, which also has a value of three. Similarly, if tails is flipped, then the option is not exercised as it's worthless. The stock value is one and the cash position in the money market is also negative one. And that leads to the same portfolio value for the agent. We can now take a look at how this position changes with the second time period to the option. So in our model, I'll start with S1H as eight and write S2HH and S2HT as 16 and 4. So we have these same sort of multipliers of doubling in price and halving in price. And what we want to do is consider this as a one period model where we can prove that the risk neutral price for our previous model does not actually hold for this model. So if we assume that we've sold our option for 1.2 and we have a delta of 0.5, we could begin to understand how our exposure to the option is no longer covered with this time period. So at time S2HH, the option value is now 11, which is the stock price of 16 minus the strike of five. As the agent who sold the option, we need our portfolio X2HH to match this value of 11. We've sold the option for 1.2 using the risk neutral price for our previous model. We now need to finance half a stock to have the same 0.5 delta. Half a stock at time S1H is going to cost us four because the stock is currently valued at eight. Therefore, we know we must borrow 2.8 from the money market. And after one time period at an interest rate of 25%, we will then owe the money market 3.5 at the next time period. At time S2HH, the value of half of our stock is 16 over two, and that's going to be eight. And the value of our money market position, as we've just calculated, is negative 3.5. So that means our portfolio position, X2HH, is 4.5.
Meanwhile, the option holder will be actually owed 11 with the stock price of 16 minus the strike price of 5. So that means we're actually making a loss of 6.5 in this scenario. We can see here that the risk neutral price and delta do not cover the exposure of the option with this model. Equally, if the second coin flip is tails, the option expires worthless with a strike of 5. However, the agent still owes the money market 3.5 and the 0.5 delta held on that stock is worth just 2. So that means the portfolio value is negative 1.5. So this small example illustrates the need for the agent to dynamically adjust the hedge on the option as the binomial model changes. We can now begin to calculate our expected delta position after each time period using the information of the stock price movement to drive our decision. If we assume the first coin flip is heads, we could begin to work out the delta head required using the future values of V2HH, V2HT, S2HH and S2HT. So let's revisit our delta hedging formula from the previous video. With a strike of 5, we know that V2H is 11, V2HT is 0, S2HH is 16, and S2HT is 4. And this leaves a delta hedge of 11 over 12 that is required. We now know that at time 1H, we must hold 11 over 12 delta to hedge our position. To obtain the fair value of the option in the market, given the first coin flip as heads, we can calculate X1H. And the value of X1H is given as the present value for the expectation of the option at time two. So we can calculate X1H by taking the expected value at time two of the portfolio, which is V2HH multiplied by P and V2HT multiplied by Q. And then what we want to do is multiply that by the interest rate for one period, and that's 1 over 1.25. So V2HH is 11 and V2HT is 0, as we mentioned earlier. And then if we multiply this by 1 over 1.25, that will leave us with 4.4. So therefore, if we were to sell a European option with one time period where the stock price starts at 8, it can go up to 16 or down to 4, our risk neutral price would be 4.4, and we would need to hold 11 over 12 delta to hedge our exposure. Let's play this exact scenario out so we can see how we are perfectly covered using the binomial model. So the option is sold for 4.4. The delta of 11 over 12 will require income of 88 over 12 to finance the correct delta as the stock price is eight. Therefore, 88 over 12 minus 4.4 is 35.2 over 12 and that's how much must be borrowed from the money market to fund the purchase of the delta amount of stock. And then at time one, we will also owe the money market 35.2 over 12 multiplied by 1.25, and that's going to be 44 over 12. So after one time period, that is how much we owe the money market to fund our purchase of the stock. If the coin flip is heads, we owe the option buyer 11. So in total, our outgoings for the option value and the money market is going to be 176 over 12, which is what we owe the option buyer and the money market. The 11 over 12 delta stock that we bought is now worth 16 times 11 over 12, which is also 176 over 12. So we can see that our delta position has cancelled out the outgoings for a heads coin flip. If the coin were to result in tails, then the option would not be exercised as the stock price of four is below that strike price of five. Our delta of 11 over 12 will still require us to borrow 35.2 over 12 from the money market, which becomes a debt of 44 over 12 at time period one. And our delta position of 11 over 12 becomes worth 4 times 11 over 12, which is also 44 over 12. So that means our hedge has also worked where the value of the stock is equal to the debt owed to the money market at time one. So our calculation has proved to us that a delta of 11 over 12 will enable us to perfectly hedge the exposure of the option given the potential payoffs and interest rate. This calculation is performed given the first theoretical coin flip as heads where the stock price starts at 8 and can go up to 16 or down to 4. 
If, however, the first coin flip is actually tails and the stock price starts at two, then the stock value at time two can either be four or it can be one. Using our delta hedging formula, we can now calculate the delta required to hedge this exposure. The values we'll plug into our formula for V2TH and V2TT are both zero as the option will have no value to the holder at time two. And for S1TH and S1TT, these are four and one. Therefore, the delta at time one, given a first coin flip of tails is zero over three, and that's going to be equal to zero. We write this as delta 1t equals zero. Given there's no expected value for the option following a first coin flip of tails, the value of the option is zero and x1t is zero. So now that we've calculated both the delta required for hedging and the option value to the holder at time one for heads or tails first coin flip, we can calculate both the delta hedge and risk neutral price at time zero on the option. We can see our model with S0 price of four, S1H of eight and S1T as two. The difference, however, with our model is that the value of the option at S1H is not five as the option hasn't expired. Instead, that value at S1H is the expected value at time two from S1H and earlier we calculated that as 4.4. So we can derive our delta zero position by using V1H of 4.4, V1T of zero, S1H of eight, and S1T of four, S1T of two, to get 4.4 divided by six. And the risk neutral price of the option at time zero, which is X zero, is the discounted value of the expected value of the option at time one, and that is one over 1.25 multiplied by 0 0.5 by 4.4, plus 0 0.5 times zero, and that's going to be equal to 1.76. And that's it. We've looked at how you can work backwards to derive a risk neutral price and the correct delta hedge to cover an asset based upon a multi-period binomial model. To recap, we break the binomial model down into individual single period models, where we can calculate the delta hedge at each position and the value of the option at the new times zero. Then we work backwards in our model to calculate the option value and delta hedge required. We don't really need to calculate all the delta values as they're not needed to derive the risk neutral price at time zero. However, it is useful for the agent to know how much delta they'll be required to hold to ensure the perfect hedge remains in place throughout all time periods. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to the channel where I'll continue to make videos on Stephen Shreve's Stochastic Calculus for Finance Part 1 and the next video is going to start looking into Chapter 2.